Well, welcome to our Easter experience. All those watching with us online today, a huge hello to you. And as you join with me today, I want you to do something. I want you to picture that you're in a tour group on a tour in Israel itself. So imagine that you aren't sitting in your lounge room right now or wherever you are, but it's like we're sitting in the upper room in Jerusalem at the southern end of Mount Zion where Jesus had His last supper with His disciples. Or perhaps we're in a Messianic believers lounge room in a tiny apartment in the Jewish quarter inside the old city. Our heart with this is that not only will you learn something new today about the incredible things that took place right here 2,000 years ago, but that you will also have a profound spiritual experience as we remember together what Jesus did for us on a cross just outside these same city walls at Easter time. So let's go on a journey together. The Easter story is the turning point of a larger story written into the very fabric of the universe before even time itself. You know, in modern times, we have the advantage of seeing in hindsight God's incredible plan for salvation. And, and you know, billions of people today around the world celebrate His life and His death and His resurrection. But for thousands of years prior to Jesus' arrival, people were waiting and watching and hoping, praying desperately for the Saviour that had been promised to them by God. And so tonight we are going to go on a journey through the story of Easter. And then we're going to end by taking communion together, just like Jesus did with His disciples the night before He died for us. But first, let's set the scene for a moment. This story, you might think, begins with a figure on a cross, or a betrayal in a garden. Or perhaps, you might think, it begins with the birth of a little baby in a stable. But our story begins thousands of years before Jesus Christ was even born. His people were slaves in a foreign country, tortured and beaten and worked till their bones failed in the land of Egypt. Our journey tonight through history starts here. You know, Jesus actually gave His life for us on the cross on one of the biggest days in Jewish tradition known as Passover. And what is Passover? Well, even if you've never been to church before, you've probably heard of Moses. Moses was born around 1590 BC, and he was called and chosen by God to help free his people from slavery under the Egyptians. They had been slaves for generations, hundreds of years, and Moses delivered the people finally to freedom, but it wasn't an easy task. And if you know the story, the Pharaoh wouldn't listen to Moses' pleas and his warnings. And God sent plagues to the Egyptians, horrific signs of His power to convince Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Now the tenth and the final plague was the most extreme. Let me lay this out for you. During the night, death, literal death, was going to sweep through the land of Egypt killing all the firstborn male children. But God set up a way for Israel to be saved. Now God said to Moses, I'm just gonna grab this bowl. If you take a perfect spotless lamb and you sacrifice it and you can dip some reeds into its blood and literally paint the blood on the doorposts of your house, 
on the tops and on the sides of the doorpost. God said, if you do this, and if your family stays inside, death will pass over your household and no death will come to you. This is actually where the name Passover or in Hebrew Peshach comes from. So the firstborn male of every household in Egypt died that night unless there was the blood of the lamb splattered over the doorposts. And it was this tragic event that finally convinced the Pharaoh to let the people of God go free. And so later that night or really early the next morning, millions of people walked away in what was called the Great Exodus, the largest organised people's migration in history to eventually settle in a land that God had promised to them. And on the way, God gave His people the Ten Commandments, along with instructions for living as His free people. And one of those instructions was to celebrate once a year a holiday called Passover. God said to them, now get this, I want you to picture this. He said, I want you to take a moment with your families and friends and stop and think back about that night when I spared your lives, when I passed over you because of the blood and set you free. And that is what the Passover is all about. In fact, that is what Easter is all about. It's about people being set free because of the blood of the Lamb, freedom from tyranny, freedom from slavery. But the deeper spiritual meaning for us today is that God wants to give us freedom from being slaves to sin, freedom from even the grip of death. Why? Because a fate worse than any oppression is eternal death. What's eternal death? It's, it's eternity without God in a place that is dark, in a place without God, without life. And if you today are caught in a web of sin, if you feel like you can't break free from slavery to thoughts or addictions or shame or guilt or past hurts, I want you to know tonight that the same God who delivered the Israelites is able to deliver you right here tonight and set you free. And this was God's plan from the very beginning. Freedom in this life and eternal freedom in the next life. Why do we need this freedom? Bluntly, because our sin is sending us to hell. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And all of us are sinners. There is none righteous. We all fall short of the glory of God. But the Bible says that the gift of God to us is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The Bible also says this, there can be no forgiveness from sin without the shedding of innocent blood. And that is why, and it's, and it's so, so, so interesting. That's why God chose on purpose that Jesus Christ would give His life during this very celebration of Passover 1400 years later. See, I don't know if you know this already or, or, or if you just caught that and realise it now that Jesus actually gave His life right on the Passover festival, right at the perfect time. And I believe that was no coincidence. God planned it this way to show the Jewish people that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice that they had been desperately waiting and praying for. He was their promise. And even more than that, God was showing the whole world that He is the Lamb of God who sacrificed Himself to set us free from sin because God knew that we could not set ourselves free from sin. And so He came Himself in the form of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God and He sacrificed Himself to set us free from our sin. So let's jump forward in time now and learn some more. One thousand four hundred years later, Jesus Christ and His disciples enter into Jerusalem. He had arrived on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy made by Zechariah hundreds of years earlier. 
your King comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. A few days later, the day of unleavened bread came, the day the Passover lamb was butchered. Jesus sent Peter and John off, saying, Go prepare the Passover for us, so we can eat together. When it was time, he sat down in the upper room, all the apostles with him, and said, You've no idea how much I have looked forward to eating this Passover meal with you, before I enter my time of suffering. And taking bread, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. You are to eat it in my memory. He did the same with the cup after supper. Drink this in remembrance of me, for this cup is the new covenant written in my blood, blood poured out for you. Now we have fast forwarded to what most scholars would say was the night of the 1st of April, 33 AD. This is the night before Jesus dies on the cross, the first day of the Passover festival. When it talks about the meal in that scripture, it's fairly likely that Jesus and his disciples were enjoying the traditional Jewish Passover celebration meal that night, which is called the cedar, the lamb, the wine, the bitter herbs, the matzah, which is the Hebrew word for the unleavened bread. These elements at the table were symbols leading all the way back to the original Passover. And they have been part of the Jewish tradition already. They had been by the time Jesus showed up for a thousand plus years already. And you know, today in 2022, most of these symbols are still part of a Jewish cedar at Passover around the world right now. People will be celebrating this in their way. But when Jesus broke bread with His disciples that night, this was a turning point in history. On this night, in a sense, Jesus brings to an end the old way to celebrate Passover, the old meaning. In a way, He brings to an end the old covenant on that night and inaugurates the new covenant, the New Testament. He ends essentially a millennia of celebration for us looking back to God's delivering power in Egypt. As in, as Christians, we no longer look back in the same way to the Passover as the key moment that God saved us, but we now look back to the cross of Christ and we see a deliverance far greater. The connection between Jesus and the Passover is why John the Baptist steps forward in John 1 29 and introduces Jesus for the first time by saying these words, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This prophetic statement immediately links Jesus to the Passover Lamb and the deliverance of not only Israel, but the whole world. And so to drive home this amazing fulfillment of Passover in Christ and all the incredible connections as we build towards taking communion together, I want to journey us through some of these amazing connections. And I want to start by focusing on the unleavened bread. So let's see if I can write on this board with all these blood drips. <laughs> I might have to clean it up. Bread. This bread that the Jewish people still make today, it's called the matzah. It's likely that this is the bread that Jesus was breaking the night he instituted communion. I'm going to put these gloves on. So I'm going to make it in front of you and I'm going to show you how every element of the way this bread is made points to Jesus. And maybe at home you could make this too, along with me, this could be like a cooking show, tutorial. <laughs> and uh, I'll go through every step as clearly as I can. Hopefully by now your oven is uh, turned on, fan bake as hot as it will go. And we're gonna break this, we're gonna bake, we're gonna bake this bread together, just like Jesus did with his disciples. We're gonna take communion. And I'd love you at home to have communion ready as well. Either this matzah bread uh, and have some grape juice ready to go or perhaps just some of your own bread if you're not gonna make the bread along with us. But firstly, 
the matzah we are making tonight and what the Jews uh, still eat for Passover to this day is known as unleavened bread, right? So what does that mean? And I'm going to start putting flour and water together. I'm just going to start mixing it with my hands. I'm going to put about a teaspoon of salt and olive oil in. Now, the salt and the olive oil, they're not traditional. Um, it wouldn't be kosher, but I'm adding that in for flavor. Because you know what I mean? I like it to taste good. I like my matzah to taste good, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to start mixing. This unleavened bread, what, is, what does unleavened mean? Well, unleavened means it doesn't have any yeast in it. And this is the type of bread God instructed the Israelites to eat at Passover time. And uh, the reason why he did that, the historical reason is, is quite interesting. It's because the Israelites needed, the Jews were escaping Egypt and they needed to make food to take with them for the journey through the desert. But they didn't have the time, right, to bake proper bread and God knew that they wouldn't and, and to wait for it to rise with, uh, with, a, with a sort of a leaven in it. So God instructed them not to use leaven, just to mix water and flour only and then knead it and then bake it. And it was a much quicker process so that they had bread ready to go in a hurry. And so I'm just gonna throw some flour on here so I can sort of get it rolling. But so to celebrate Passover for thousands of years, God instructs His people to continue to use unleavened bread to remind them of that moment. But the cool thing about God is that there's always more layers going on at one time. And I think it's amazing that it wasn't just when God instructs them to use unleavened bread. It wasn't just to remind them of that moment, although that was part of it, but it was also purposefully pointing to something that was coming in the future. It was pointing to Jesus. But how? I'm so glad you asked. I'm gonna split this up. Put this one over here. We'll focus on this one for now. Firstly, yeast in the Bible or leaven is a symbol for sin. So when Jesus says, this is my body broken for you, He is saying, I am unleavened. I am without sin. And so the connection to the Passover is that Jesus is our perfect, spotless, sinless lamb. He is the bread of life. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Man. And so when Jesus is using this unleavened bread, He's referring to it. He's saying, this is my body broken for you. He's holding unleavened bread and it's just a picture of the fact that He is sinless and spotless and that He's the bread of life. It's so cool, but you can see I've rolled it out like as flat as I can and that's, that's super important. You wanna get it as flat as you can so that it will bake quickly. But here's where it gets really, really interesting. If we examine the matzah carefully, we see that not only is it unleavened and then crushed and rolled out flat, you know, as flat as possible. But get this, it is actually then pierced and striped. You know, King David wrote prophetically about Jesus in Psalm 22, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. He wrote, a band of evildoers has encompassed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. And so traditionally, and perhaps without even realizing the connections, Jews as the next step making the matzah will pierce holes in the bread. And the reason for this is quite practical. It's because you don't want it to rise. You don't want the bread to look like it's had any form of rising. This poking holes in it essentially stops it from bubbling when it's in the oven. But I think it's amazing that the next step in making the matzah is that Jews would actually pierce it 
in these stripes, in these straight lines. Jesus, the Messiah, we know was without sin. He was unleavened and yet he was striped by way of the Roman whip and pierced by nails through his hands and through his feet and by a spear in his side. I believe it is no coincidence that the central item of the Passover, the matzah, points to the one that Paul called Messiah, our Passover, the one who was broken and pierced and striped, the same one that John called the Lamb of God, the one whose sacrifice would bring redemption from the penalty of sin and the connections don't stop there. I'm just gonna add, before we put this into the oven, some uh, rosemary, <laughs> again, just for taste, this ain't kosher, but also just some salt, a bit of flaky salt there, salt bay action. I'm just gonna grab my tray and put it on the tray. We're gonna bake it in the oven. If your oven's as hot as it can go, with this bread as flat as it is, it should only take about seven minutes. So while we put it in the oven, I'm gonna talk about some other connections between Jesus and Passover because there's so much more. You know, in the Passover regulations, the, the sacrificial lamb had to be chosen and brought into Jerusalem to be presented at the temple four days before Passover. This was very specific. So the next connection is that Jesus' arrival. Exactly four days before His death on the cross at Passover, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and presented himself at the temple. He comes in through the Eastern Gate, which is called the Mercy Gate, and the crowds shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, as he was fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah 9 that said, Behold, your King is coming to you, a Saviour riding on a donkey. He was literally the Lamb of God being presented at the perfect exact day. So here's another interesting connection. It turns out that for centuries, Passover lambs were raised in Bethlehem and in Bethlehem only. So that's our next connection, Bethlehem. Bethlehem. In those shepherd's fields there in Bethlehem, a very special breed of sacrificial lamb was raised and nurtured to be brought to Jerusalem at Passover to be slaughtered to cover the people's sins. How fitting then that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be born right there in Bethlehem. His parents literally walked halfway across the country without possibly even realizing that they were fulfilling Scripture just so that God's plan would unfold in His perfect timing. And so Jesus would be born on the night they arrived, right there where it was prophesied that the Messiah would be born. And of course, right where the Jewish people of the time would already be familiar that the sacrificial lambs would always come from. How amazing is the intricacy of God's plan perfectly falling into place in these moments. Here's another interesting thing. The Israelites weren't allowed to break the bones of the lamb while celebrating Passover, not during the cooking, not during even the eating, or the preparing or anything. So our next connection is the bones. And this is a strange one, not to break the bones of the sacrificial lamb. Why did God insist on this? Well, there was a messianic prophecy in Psalms 34, 20 that said, He protects all His bones. Not one of them will be broken. You know, Jesus' bones, I don't know if you know this, but none of them were broken during the torture and the mockery that He endured or even during the crucifixion. Normally, to speed up the death of someone on a cross, the Romans would end up breaking their legs with huge mallets. This would mean they couldn't put any more weight on their legs to push themselves up and they would die faster of asphyxiation as their lungs would compress and collapse as they couldn't put any more weight on their knees now that they are broken. But the book of John tells us that when the soldiers came to Jesus to break His legs, to speed up His death, they found to their surprise that He was already dead. So they pierced His side with a spear, but they did not break His legs. As John testifies, these things happened so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of His bones 
will be broken, John 19, 36. Then the next connection, while our bread's still baking, is the blood. I love how most of these start with B, except for arrival. Couldn't think of a word like that that started with B. <laughs> I went looking through the thesaurus. But anyway, we got blood. We already saw that the Israelites had to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost as a sign to God and whoever stayed in the house behind the blood of the lamb was safe from God's judgment against the Egyptians. Now with Christ, whoever stays with Jesus and does His will, the blood of the lamb will keep them safe from judgment. It's like we apply His blood to the doorposts of our hearts. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from every sin, 1 John 1, 7. Tonight, as we finish, we're gonna take communion together and take a moment to remember what He did for us. And while we talk about the blood of Jesus, the grape juice I've got here right now, it's not wine, it's just grape juice. The grape juice that I'm pouring is symbolic of that same blood of Jesus that was poured out for us on the cross, His blood. It's amazing how everything points to Jesus. Even today, the Jewish people still celebrate Passover, but they can no longer incorporate the sacrificial lamb as part of their celebration because they have no temple to do the sacrifice. So instead of the lamb, which used to be the focus of the Passover meal, tradition has now adapted and shifted to focus on the matzah, on the unleavened bread. I find this interesting because of course, I believe respectfully, the reason they can't still partake of the lamb today is because spiritually the lamb of God has already come and he's already been sacrificed once for all time. It is done. He said, it is finished. There is no more sacrifice needed. There is no more waiting for a savior because he is here. I'm gonna pull the matzah out of the oven and so, they can't do this with the lamb. So they're forced to go to the bread. But 2000 years later, even the bread points to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And you know, wrapping it up now, you can see here with the matzah, it is now bruised. See these little brown patches on it from the baking. These little brown bruises, I think it's plain as day for all to see. It has been crushed, pierced, striped, and now bruised. 700 years before Jesus was even born in the book of Isaiah, it prophesied these very words. Isaiah 53, four to six in the Orthodox Jewish Bible says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the Musa, the chastisement that brought us shalom or peace was upon Him, the Messiah, Mashiach. And at the cost of His shabura, His stripes, we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon Him and at the cost of His stripes, we are healed. This is a picture of Jesus right here, even in the bread tonight. Imagine Jesus on that night in that upper room, holding bread like this, a picture of what He was about to go through in the next 24 hours and saying to His disciples, this is my body, broken, for you, pierced, bruised, striped, crushed. I'm going to go through this to pay the price for your sin because there can be no forgiveness for your sin without the shedding of innocent blood. And so I'm going to give mine. That's what this cup is about. That's what this bread is about. That's what it's always been about. What you've been celebrating for thousands of years is me. 
and what I'm about to do for you. I'm not sure if the disciples could see the significance of what was taking place in that moment. Jesus was changing the Passover, but more than that, Jesus was becoming the Passover for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. John 6, 33 to 35, as we take communion together, tonight as we partake in the Lord's Supper together. I want to draw your attention back to a line I said at the start of the night in reference to the Passover. God said to His people, I want you to take a moment with your families and friends and stop and think back about that night when I spared your lives, when I passed over you because of the blood and set you free. And tonight, almost 4,000 years since Passover and almost 2,000 years since the cross, Jesus is now saying the same thing to us. He's saying, take a moment with friends and family tonight. Stop and think back on what I have done for you. I took those stripes on my back and I carried that cross and I was pierced through. I gave my life for you because the wages of your sin is death. I knew blood had to be spilled, but I didn't want it to be yours. So now if you would just apply my blood to the doorposts of your heart, you will be set free. Jesus said, I did this for you because I love you. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So let's have a moment as we partake. Let's just listen to the words of the song we're about to sing and think about Jesus. You can sing along if you like, or you can just stop. Just listen. Just, just take it in. And, and just in your own time during this song, during this moment, just take your own communion and thank Him. Not a hill in Israel, mercy spoke for me. Mercy spoke for me, mercy spoke for me. It was on the Street, his death brought liberty, his death brought liberty, his death brought liberty. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. May I not forget the blood He shed and it is by His death I am alive because of Christ I am alive. What a humble sacrifice Love that washed me clean Love that washed me clean Love that washed me clean What a blessed mystery His punishment, my peace His punishment, my peace His punishment, my peace Jesus Christ, may I not forget the blood He shed, and it is by His death I am. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our Passover lamb, that you took the weight of our sin on your shoulders. I thank you for your body, which was broken for us. I thank you for your blood, which was poured out for us. You did it all for us to bring us salvation and freedom. And God, we're so grateful. God, I am so grateful. Help me to live for you. Help me to never forget what you did for me. Thank you in Jesus' name. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. Before we finish, I want to give everyone who's joining with us today an opportunity to give their life to Christ. This is what is symbolized by applying the blood of the lamb to the doorposts. If tonight you would apply the blood of Jesus that was spilled for you to the doorposts of your heart, either for the first time or even as a recommitment, you will be saved. That's the promise of salvation. You will be set free. The Bible says you become born again. It is the beginning of an incredible journey that starts with meeting the Saviour of the world, the Passover Lamb. So to lead into this moment, I want to mention one more incredible connection to the Jewish tradition of Passover as we finish. During the Passover meal today. And some scholars will say that this tradition was there in Jesus' time. Some say it developed in Orthodox Jewish uh, communities in the first century. But today, in 2022, around the world, there will be Jewish families this weekend doing this as part of their cedar. I want you to read this word. I'm not sure if I will pronounce it correctly. A fecumen. In a traditional cedar, at the start of the night, the father breaks the matzah in two. He places the smaller piece down on top of a cloth on the table, ready to be eaten. But he wraps the larger piece, which is called the afikumen, in a white linen cloth. Then the children leave the room and while they are gone, the father buries the afikamen somewhere in the room. Then the children return. At the end of the meal, they all search for the buried treasure of unleavened bread, which as we know has been striped, bruised, pierced and crushed and now wrapped in cloth, buried, and is now earnestly searched for and when discovered is found to be of great value because the child who finds it receives a gift. But I want you to hear this tonight. If you, if you truly find Jesus, you receive the greatest gift. There are many components to the Passover cedar, both traditionally, historically, and today in modern times that either pointed forward or point back to Jesus Christ. But even just this one section with the Afika men is such a clear symbol of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Isn't that amazing? That tradition without people perhaps even knowing it. It's like 
literally describing to your family the story of what Jesus did for us and even His resurrection. Jesus is weaved through the whole tradition. You can't escape Him. He was broken. He was bruised. He was beaten, striped, pierced, killed and then buried, but then He rose again. And then when we find Him, like those children who go searching, Jesus has come to me like a child. But no matter who we are and what we've done or where we've come from, if if we find Him, we find the pearl of great price. We find the free gift of salvation. We find the free gift of eternal life. There's no payment for us to make. He's already paid it with His blood and He accepts us all. He says, there is a place for you at my table. All are welcome. But as with all free gifts, you have to accept it for yourself. And if you watching at home, wherever you are, if you would like to respond to that invitation tonight and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, if you would like to give your heart to Him, to paint His blood on the doorposts and the lintels of your heart, maybe for the first time, or maybe as a recommitment this Easter 2022, then I'd love to have you say a prayer with me. Just close your eyes right now and say this with me, dear Jesus, I thank You right now that You died on a cross for me. You gave Your life for me. Your body was broken for me. Your blood was poured out for me. And tonight, I give You my life and I thank You for receiving me into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. You know, if you said that prayer with me, either for the first time or as a recommitment, I'd just love to break the fourth wall a bit and ask you to click the link that's in the description of the video. It's right there, it's super easy to find, it's right up the top and we've put that there because really simply, we would just love to get connected with you Our heart is to help you get started on this incredible journey of walking with Jesus. And we want to send you a Bible as a gift from us to you. So please do what you can to reach out this Easter. Finding Jesus is what it's all about. And I wanna finish by saying thank you. Thank you for joining our online Easter experience. I hope you experience a touch of the Spirit of God somewhere throughout our time together. I wanna let you know that you are invited to join us every Sunday online at 10 a.m. or head along to one of our locations around New Zealand. Everyone is welcome. There is a place for you. So from all of us here at City Impact Church, we wanna say to you and your family, have a wonderful Easter.